So I'm going to talk about uh, how the pomace fly saved neuroscience. So pomace is any crushed fruit. And uh, the, the fruit fly that you might have heard about is not actually a fruit fly. It's a pomace fly. And that's for legal reasons, because if we try to import them from different countries, then, then people don't, uh, don't uh, incinerate our flies. So, so good things come from pomace. On the left is, is grappa, one of my favorite drinks. On the right is this fly that's had so much impact on neuroscience. And so it was first discovered uh, as a great genetic tool in, in the 1910s by a guy called Morgan. No, I think he's falling down. And uh, what, they, what they did was they had uh, these milk bottles that they used to steal from stoops in, uh, in Harlem and, uh, and grow the flies on bananas. And they were very easy to grow, and they could find mutants. So they found all these mutants with different eye colors. Uh, so a, a white eye color or cinnamon eye color, uh, black. And then they were able to use these different mutants to figure out, this guy Alfred Sturdivan, that the mutations exist on a line. So they figured out for the first time that a chromosome is, uh, is, is a linear thing. And they figured out that, that the, the different genes could exist, could, could anyway, never mind. So, <laughs> so then there was this guy. That way? Yeah. Then there's this guy, uh, Seymour Benzer, and he came along in the 60s, and he used to work on semiconductors. Uh, but then he thought, well, maybe we can study the genetics in a, f in a fly uh, for behavior, behavioral genetics. And he said, well, the Earth rotates, and we know that there's these things called circadian rhythm, and that um, <clears throat> animals are known to change their behavior with circadian rhythm. So maybe we can find genes that control the, the circadian rhythm and the, the, the daily cycle of things. So he put the flies in the tube. Uh, and they would live on food in the tube, and you could measure their activity throughout a 24-hour cycle. Um, but what you couldn't do until then was try to mutate them and find mutants. And he found three mutants. So in the top one is a wild type, and it has a normal 24-hour cycle. Uh, the second one is arrhythmic, and the third and fourth have both short and long periods. And this was the first time ever that anyone had seen a mutant of a behavior. They'd only seen a physical mutant of, say, the eye or the body color. And he told his friend, who's a Nobel laureate on the left, and he was really upset because he'd scooped him. Uh, he thought that he could study behavior in a slime mold, but uh, Seymour had beaten him. And, uh, and so now we know that the circadian rhythm is controlled by a molecular clock, and it's got a lot of different proteins, and they interact with each other, uh, and they, they oscillate. And that this molecular machine generates the behavior. Uh, and since then, there's been a sort of a frenzy of studying behavior with genetics. So uh, in the fly. So this is, this is a gap crossing. The fly has to cross uh, from one, you know, one thing to another. And it has to have a concept of its own body size. It has to have a concept of how big the gap is. And it's kind of strange to think of a fly has, has, has a, an idea of body representation in its brain. And um, the, the nice thing about the fly is because there's so many genetic tools, we can do thousands of different Phineas Gage experiments. So Phineas Gage was the guy who had a, a poker go through his brain, his personality changed. So we can use the genetic tools to, to knock out many different parts of the brain and do those Phineas Gage experiments. We can study uh, olfactory memory, uh, where the fly has to choose between two odors, but if it gets an electric shock, uh, it, uh, in the top there, it, it likes the green odor, but after giving it some electric shocks in the presence of the green odor, it runs away from the green odor and runs towards the pink odor. So we can study, we can study memory in a very detailed way uh, through the fly's locomotor uh, behavior. Uh, and we can use the genetic tools to do uh, very detailed anatomy. Uh, so this is a part of a brain in a fly. And the green neurons are the neurons that we think are inputting the aversive information from the shock into the memory circuits of the fly. Uh, there's also courtship. Flies, of course, have sex. And this is, this is like a threesome there on the left. Um, but they also, they also sing. And you can actually uh, not only record the song, and it's actually it's a surprisingly deep sound. It's like brr, brr. Um, <laughs> And uh, you can do fly CCTV, so you know, video them walking around and use uh, computer software to see, see how they walk, their different patterns of walking, how they like to interact with each other. Um, and then there's this idea of the pan, what is it, the pan ethopticon. So viewing every aspect of the fly's behavior and analyzing it with a computer. So walking, crab walk, reverse walking, touching, uh, in, in a very detailed way. And uh, people are so into this idea that now the Howard Hughes Medical Institute has spent some quarter of a billion dollars on this huge palazzo that's, that's largely dedicated to studying the uh, behavior of the humble pomace fly. Uh, so we'll see where that goes.